Thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon at our controlled aerodromes webinar. Um, we have uh, uh, we've had hundreds of people register and uh, and uh, and jump on board with us this afternoon from all over Australia. So we certainly do appreciate the fact that you've joined us here today. Um, my name is Tim Penny. I'm an aviation safety advisor. I work out of I work out of CASA's Melbourne office and um, I'll be your host uh, this afternoon. And it, uh, it, certainly is, um, it certainly is good to have our subject matter expert, um, Anthony Macbeth from Tamworth Tower. Anthony's given us a wave there. I hope you can see him in the corner of your screen. Um, I, uh, I certainly hope that there's someone else up there in the tower doing the controlling while you're talking to us, Tony, because you're, you're facing the wrong way. But no, that's lovely. So um, just a few housekeeping things to, to, to start with. So thanks very much for joining us. We certainly know that um, your uh, time is precious. Um, and uh, we also understand that people's attention spans are limited when they're in their webinar environment. But uh, we certainly aim to make this webinar as useful as possible. Um, to give you some, some short and sharp information to take away and apply to your own flying, whether you are flying commercially or you're a, a private pilot, um, if you're flying in controlled airspace all the time, or if you are only an infrequent visitor to a controlled aerodrome. Um, we want to basically make your uh, operations in the controlled aerodrome environment as, as safe and efficient as we possibly can. Um, we have large numbers with us this afternoon. We certainly do. Um, the registration has been quite amazing, actually. I think we had over 500 register uh, as of this afternoon. And Landy, um, who's in our Brisbane office, she's the moderator. She's kind of controlling all the buttons and dials just to um, just to make sure the technology works OK and we have bandwidth and all the rest of it. We have just muted everyone for the moment and turned their cameras off um, just to make sure that everyone can hear what's going on and uh, and uh, we get through the presentation smoothly. Um, we will actually be recording this webinar. So Landy will, uh, Landy will hit the record button because it's our aim to put our, uh, our webinar on CASA's Pilot Safety Hub on the CASA's website. And the link to that Pilot Safety Hub can be found on the web page, uh, the homepage, sorry, of CASA's website. Um, on your screen, you should have across the top of your screen a little chat bubble, uh, looks like a little cartoon chat bubble. If you click on that, um, we, uh, can, um, we can see if you want to um, put in some questions. You can type in some questions on the right hand side of, uh, of the screen and um, uh, we will try and get to as many of those questions as we can, time permitting of course. But if there are any questions or comments that perhaps we don't get to, we're certainly going to chase those up. Um, we'll certainly chase those up after the event. Um, it's our intention is to hopefully get all this done and dusted as much as we can within about 45 minutes or so. We find that for most people, that's about the, the normal attention span at these types of webinars. So if everyone's happy, I'm going to I'm going to just kick off and introduce this topic. I'll talk for a little bit and then I'll and then I'll hand across to uh, then I'll hand across to Tony um, uh, up there in Tamworth to um, take us through his presentation and um, hopefully we can learn from the subject matter expert himself. So after the welcome and housekeeping, I'll just give you a quick little agenda. I'm just going to prevent a brief overview and um, then I'll introduce um, then I'll introduce Anthony to talk specifically about his topics um, as a controller at the coalface. Then we'll have hopefully some question and discussion time and then I'll wrap up at the end. And as I said, we'll hopefully have this done in about 45 minutes or so. So really, um, a, a lot of this centres, of course, around Air Services Australia. Air Services is authorised to, you know, by CASA to operate under Civil Aviation Safety Reg Part 172. 
and um, we oversight we oversight air services, and we also audit and inspect their ongoing activities. Um, we also license air traffic controllers as well under CASA Part 65, and CASA also um, implement um, ATC's medical standards as well through the issue of what we call a Class Three medical. And air services, just like any other operator around Australia, is subject, of course, to um, other uh, pieces of oversight such as Part 99 drug and alcohol testing because it is a safety sensitive aviation activity of course and as I said earlier they're regularly audited and inspected. So really what what's the size of the industry that we're, we're talking about here? Um, uh, you can see there that we have uh, we have about 29 civilian ATC towers across Australia and air services, uh, according to their website anyway, look after about 11% of the world's um, airspace. They manage more than 4 million aircraft movements carrying um, almost about 160 million, um, 160 million uh, passengers around Australia every year. And uh, at last count, there's about a thousand civilian air traffic controllers. Bear in mind, of course, in the in the air traffic control world, we also have the military that run air traffic control towers at places like Williamtown near Newcastle, Tyndall in Catherine and Darwin, etc. And they also have a number of air traffic controllers looking after military controlled airspace. Please also be aware, just at this juncture, um, everyone, that air services is not CASA and CASA is not air services. That can sometimes be a bit confusing. Uh, we used to be married together until about 1995 when the great divorce happened. And CASA is now the, the regulator and air services is the air navigation services provider. So we are two separate two separate entities. But of course, there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of um, uh, crossover and, and, and correspondence between the two organisations. So controlled aerodromes, which is really why we're here um, to, to, to talk about today, controlled aerodromes are primarily, primarily they're a service to the aviation community uh, and, and the travelling public. Um, they, they are a service provider, an air nav services provider. And what they provide through controlled aerodromes is really an enhanced level of safety. Um, uh, and I'll look. I'll let Anthony talk more about those specifics as as we go through our presentation this afternoon. But really, one of the things we have to always just be aware of is that ATC is there to provide a service to the public. Um, to drill down a little bit more, um, so we don't have you know a free for all at our busy aerodromes around Australia. ATC are there to provide an orderly flow of of, of traffic, both VFR and IFR not only in the air, but also on the surface of these controlled airports and into and out of the control zone. Um, air services, uh, air traffic controllers provide separation services, sequencing, and also vital traffic informa information to help, to help um, pilots in the air manage their own workload. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through the presentation. So really, um, they are an essential. They are an essential service in Australia and also around the world, and um, we'd certainly be lost without them, especially at these busy airfields. Now, when we talk about controlled airports, in in a, in a lot of in a lot of people's minds, especially those people that don't fly often or people that may have done a lot of their training outside of controlled airspace, or if you spend a lot of your time out in regional Australia, controlled aerodromes can certainly be intimidating to a lot of pilots. Now, a lot of pilots and potentially a lot of pilots that have tuned in this afternoon to, um, to, to, to get a few hints and tips um, from our webinar this afternoon, they might have had little exposure to such um, to such airfields, but they may want to expand. They won't. They may want to expand their their own flying, or maybe have needs in the future to go to to airports that are controlled. Um, and of course, we've also heard these horror stories over 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 the time. And I'm sure every pilot that's tuning in with us this afternoon has probably got a story where they've been fearful of say of either doing or saying the wrong thing, um, and maybe you know people have been growled at by by air traffic controllers hopefully that's a thing of the past and 
there is probably also, you know, within that, within the private sphere of flying, you know, a, a an underlining fear along among some people of going into controlled aerodromes. But please, please, please remember that ATC are in fact here to assist pilots. Um, and they're certainly not robots. Please remember also that, you know, controllers are human as well. And they suffer exactly the same type of frailties and, and they're subject to the same types of things that, that, that we as pilots have to deal with every time we go flying. So air traffic controllers, you know, they're subject to such things as a lot of human factors like distraction, um, losses of situational awareness, um, air traffic controllers can also suffer from things like information overload because I'm sure Anthony will agree in busy airspace when everything's happening all at once, that's something that they have to guard against. Air traffic controllers also can suffer because they're human from things like fatigue, um, uh, stress, um, even breakdowns in communication. And even on the odd occasion, according to Anthony anyway, error because they they are human and and even ATC do commit errors from time to time and just like us as aviators as pilots they work in a very high consequence environment as well and just like pilots air traffic controllers are trying to do their job as best as they possibly can so they can assist you to do your job as pilots as best as you possibly can as well so in many ways, it's a, it, it's a two-way partnership. And that's one of the things that we'd like to emphasise today, this two-way partnership approach. So if everyone's happy with that, just a few more things I, I, I thought I'd just manage bef uh, talk, to talk about before I hand over to Anthony. Um, they're a valuable resource. And what they do, air traffic controllers, is they help us as pilots manage our workload and they provide additional layers of safety, especially at those critical phases of flight, often when we find ourselves with, with high levels of workload. And they might be times, as you can see there, when we're close to the ground, take off, approach and landing, that kind of makes sense. In bad weather, also if we are perhaps unfamiliar with the, with the, local, with the local airfield there or, or, or the airspace surrounding it, or if we're dealing with emergencies. Um, those busiest phases of flight are when we can particularly um, utilise the resources that ATC have at their disposal to assist us in managing our workload. Um, so ATC is a is a is a significant workload management resource. So all of us as pilots, we should never be reluctant to actually make use of them. And it certainly is, as I said before, a two-way partnership between pilot and controller. And successful or safe aviation can't, can't work in these environments unless that partnership is working. Um, ATC are also an extra set of eyes and ears that can help pilots see the big picture. They can see things we can't, but also by the same token, we can probably see things that they might not be able to see as well. So although ATC might not be in the cockpit with us, that relationship is incredibly, incredibly important. And there are responsibilities on both sides of the fence for, for that relationship to work at its absolute best. And it should ideally be a two-way partnership. So I think, it's, I, I think it's a really important thing to remember that a really good knowledge of the different roles and responsibilities, and also I suppose an expectation of what each side of the relationship can contribute to is really, really important. And that's probably one of the major things that Anthony is going to expand on when he chats to us in a, in a, in a few minutes. So just to take this a little bit further before I hand over to, to Anthony, who's patiently waiting up there in Tamworth, um, please remember that you, as the pilot, as the license holder sitting behind the wheel, you are still the pilot in command. Um, ATC cannot fly the aircraft for you, and Anthony will talk more about that later. And secondly, preparation is vital. We want to give ourselves as pilots the best possible opportunity for a safe and efficient flight, regardless of the airspace that we're in. So making use of all the tools we have available to us will certainly go a long way to making the flight successful and as stress-free as possible. So things like the AIP, 
dusting off the ursa making sure it's the current edition and having a really really good read of the local procedures at each of these airfields delving into the the, the, the mysterious wonderful world of no tams where there are certain little key things that we can miss if we don't have that actual discipline to go in and have a look at some things that may have changed and don't be afraid to seek advice seek advice from senior pilots seek advice from instructors talk to other pilots dive onto the air services website as well the air services australia safety promotion team are putting out more and more information as we go along so their website um, is becoming increasingly important for getting hold of that good generic safety promotion info depending on whatever types of operations you're flying or what airspace you're flying in and at the end of the day uh, most uh, most ATC towers have their phone number in Ursa, and if there's a if there's a particular question or an issue that you, you're stuck with, always consider perhaps giving them a call. Probably best to not try and call them when you know things are things are fully busy and they're and they're working really hard at a busy time of day. But I'm sure most air traffickers are more than happy to just answer a query when the phone rings and just provide local pilots with some guidance. So that's just a bit of an overview of kind of where we're going and, 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 and where all of this sits. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask Anthony to take control of the presentation, if he doesn't mind, from his little perch up there in Tamworth. And um, uh, I'll ask Anthony to flick across to his next slide. And uh, this is Anthony Macbeth. He's a tower controller based up in Tamworth in New South Wales. So thanks very much for joining us, Anthony. And uh, we might just start, if you don't mind, with maybe a brief rundown of, of your career. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the introduction. A big thanks to Gail Rutledge, who put all my presentation together. So my name is Anthony Macbeth. Most people know me as Tony. I've been an air trafficker for 27 years now. So I had 10 years in Brisbane and the rest of the time been here in Tamworth. In that time, I've held various ratings from Oceanic to Sydney Arrivals East to here in Tamworth, non-radar approach and obviously aerodrome. I've also done work for Air Services Head Office in safety and in national checking. Prior to being in air traffic control, I was a Jackaroo and also a CPL with a grade two flying instructor rating. Unfortunately, that's now lapsed, but I did a fair bit of work with Gunnadar Aero Club. So the first thing I want to talk about is the role of the tower controller. Now, our basic role is to stop aircraft hitting things, either each other or terrain. So we get aircraft safely on and off the ground, prevent collisions between aircraft and prevent collisions between aircraft and the ground, and then do things like provide med information, aerodrome information, en route information and that sort of thing. When you're dealing with regional towers particularly, most of the time you'll be dealing with either Class Charlie or Class Delta airspace. Now there's still three towers that have Class Delta, correction, Class Charlie procedural airspace being Tamworth, Albury and Alice Springs. But obviously the main differences between the radar environment and non-radar is the way the information is presented. So in radar, you have a large screen, look at the screen, and most of the time the radar controls we use either five miles or three miles and a thousand feet, generally speaking. Non-radar, depending on where you are, but most of the time we use coloured cardboard strips and we use different separation standards such as visual, we use line features, vertical separation, uh, Lateral separation where we'll use things like VOR radials or GNSS tracks. In a non-radar environment, we require a lot more reports because while we have a screen, we can't use it for separation. So we'll ask for reports to confirm your position, distance, altitude, that sort of thing. So that updates our mental map as to where you are and how we're getting you and how we're keeping you safe through the airspace. The biggest difference between Class Charlie and Class Delta airspace is in Class Charlie, I have to separate VFR to IFR. In Class Delta, I have to segregate VFR to IFR, which means 
in class, Charlie, if I have a VFR and IFR aircraft, I have to have a published separation standard, so vertical, lateral, line feature, that sort of thing. In class Delta, if I have a VFR aircraft 12 miles to the north and an IFR aircraft 15 miles to the south, I can say those two aircraft, there's no collision risk exists, so I'm happy. So that's why you'll find sometimes in the Class D or Class Charlie airspace, you'll be pushed down into the Class Delta airspace because it does make the separation a lot simpler. So we see the two difference between ground and tower frequency. So if you have a look on the screen there, I've taken the screenshot of the Tamworth Ursa. And you can see there's a SMC frequency, which is Tamworth ground and delivery, and then the tower frequency. Now Tamworth's a bit special because we have two runways. So we have a separate tower frequency for each runway. What ground does is gives you your airways clearance, taxi clearances, and that sort of thing. Tower will give you departure instructions, departure, uh, things like takeoff clearance, landing clearance. When it's busy here in Tamworth, we have a separate person sitting on the ground and a separate person in the tower frequencies. When it's quiet, all the frequencies are combined. So that's why you're always, that's why sometimes you hear the same voice when you swap over between frequencies. Now, some of the trips and traps. Wake turbulence is a funny one. If you do, well, funny is probably not the right word. If you do a search on YouTube, there are plenty of clips of the effect of wake turbulence on lighter aircraft. Looking at the chart there, most regional towers will use time-based standards for their departures. It's rare for the regionals to get a super heavy coming in. The only place I know of that gets supers is Alice Springs when they've had the A380s come in to the parking area there. Heavies are quite rare as well. Rocky probably gets a few with the US military. Again, Alice Springs, not too many others. Medium aircraft are the most common ones. So things like the Dash 8 400 series are mediums. Boeing 737s and a lot of the military jets. Now, depending on where the heavier aircraft rolls and where you roll from depends on the amount of time. Usually it's either three minutes or two minutes in general. And again, generally, it'll be something like line up, expect delay due wake turbulence. Another bit of a trip or trap is special VFR. Now, again, special VFR is a bit of an interesting one. If conditions are below normal VMC, by day, at pilot request, within a CTR or CTA, a pilot can request special VFR, which means they have to remain clear of cloud. And for fixed wing visibility greater than 60, uh, correction, visibility at least 1600 metres or greater, and for helicopters at least 800 metres or greater. Now, one of the main things with special VFR is we have to separate special VFR from IFR. So we do have a condition that provided an IFR flight won't be delayed, we can approve special VFR. But just keeping in mind, it is at pilot request. We can't force you to take special VFR. Just a quick question on that um, from myself while I've got you here, Anthony, special VFR. Yep. Do you use that primarily to get people out of the zone or to bring people into the zone? Both. Um, okay. It, it's it, Once upon a time, it was for just exiting and entering the zone, but it can also be used for uh, circuits now as well. It can be op used for operating within the zone, but yeah, for both entering and exiting the zone. Yeah, and one of the things that, one of the things that, pilots need to remember is that once they clear that controlled airspace, then the normal VFR, the normal VFR or VMC criteria apply. It's only relevant when you're in that controlled airspace. That's right. Cool. Um, probably a bit of a trip with, or a bit of a trap with special VFR that we have seen is pilots request special VFR to get out of the zone and the conditions get worse so they can't get back in because it then turns to full IMC. So it's something just to make sure with the situation awareness of the actual conditions when you're requesting special VFR.
All right, so what can pilots do to help us, to help you, to make operations safer and more efficient? My first point there, uh, my apologies, my first point, when in doubt, ask every time. I'd much rather go over a clearance several times than have a misunderstanding which leads to a safety issue. I might be getting a bit tetchy if we get to the eighth time and we're still going over it, but I'd still rather do that than us have an issue. So always keep that in mind. When in doubt, ask. If you can, if you haven't put a flight plan in on first contact with ground or with the tower when you're inbound, let us know your intentions. So something along the lines of Tamworth Tower, Alpha Bravo Charlie with inbound details or overflying details or circuit details, departure details, area work, whatever it is, give us a hint. As I spoke about before, we use different coloured strips. So if you give me that hint when you first start talking, I can grab the right coloured strip and then that starts my mental processing, who you are, where you are, what I have to do to get you in. As Tim already alluded to, if you're going somewhere that you're not familiar with or you haven't been to for a while or you've heard it's a bit tricky, give the tower a ring. If I go back to the role of ground and tower, you can see down here there's a tower number. So it's usually listed in URSA. Give us a call. We can then talk to you about what you want to do, what's the best way to get in, what sort of trips and traps there are as you come in, all that sort of thing. So yeah, don't ever be afraid to give the tower a ring. I really appreciate it when pilots do give us a call. And even if you've given us a call, when you're coming into somewhere you're not entirely familiar with, either the first time or you haven't been in for years, as part of your transmission, use the word unfamiliar. Now that's not an admission of ignorance, and it's not an admission of guilt, for want of a better word. It's just letting us know that you're not entirely familiar with the local area or the local procedures. It changes the way we deal with the pilot because it means that we won't ask for maybe more obscure positions. And we'll probably treat you a little bit differently. So yeah, the word unfamiliar works really well. Now, going back to the when in doubt ask, if the clearance or the instruction doesn't make sense, or if you can't comply with it, let us know. Don't just blast on through, let us know. And then we'll come up with an alternative. Now, always important, use standard phraseology. If you use the words I'm expecting and I use the words you're expecting, again, we stay on the same page and we're hopefully gonna have a good day. Obviously, there are times when standard phraseology isn't appropriate, but where possible, use standard phraseology. If you're coming in VFR, have your VTC handy. I might ask you if you're coming into Tamworth, are you familiar with the New England Highway? If I hear you say, I'm not, but I'm looking at my VTC now, that fills me with a lot more hope than I don't have a VTC on board, where is it? So have your VTC handy. If I ask you for a position, again, it doesn't make sense, just let me know. And I know I've already said it three times, but when in doubt, ask. And if it comes to that point, ask in plain language, as in, I give you a clearance, it doesn't make sense, just say to me, do you mean me to do such and such? Okay, common mistakes pilots make and what we can do to avoid them. Probably the biggest one I'm noticing at the moment is readbacks. Know what you have to read back. Now, we as controllers have very firm requirements about what has to be read back, and we will chase you and chase you and chase you until we get what we need. Now, yep, it might seem pedantic and it might be a bit of a pain, but it's our safety backup to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, frequency issues. Avoid stepping on other transmissions. Try to avoid swapping from one frequency to the other and blasting straight in. Try and listen for two or three or four minutes before you enter the control zone, before you make your first transmission, so that you get some situation awareness about what's around you and what's going on. I know it can be difficult in a busy environment to get your message across, but particularly on that first contact, have a listen out so that you're not over-transmitting anyone. 
Think about what you want to say before you press that button to avoid ramming transmissions. Look, I do the same. Keeping in mind that the press to talk button, both the ATC press to talk button and the pilot press to talk switch is the world's best brain removal tool. You can sit there and you can practice, and I've done it myself when I first came here. I practice Gira gap, clear Gira gap direct and with 3,000 four to five miles. I'd say that to myself, say that to myself, press the press to talk and all that come out would be, ah. So keep your transmissions concise and please try and practice what you want to say, but just keeping in mind that the first few times that press to talk, it's deadly. Hey, Anthony, just while you're talking about using the radio, a quick yep. question from Chris, one of our guests. Yes. What are the most common things pilots don't read back? What's one of the most common things they usually fail to read back or get wrong? <laughs> it's been a combination just recently. It's it's actually been everything, but probably here in Tamworth, one of the main things is crossing active runways, crossing the grass runways. Always got to read back, even if the runway is closed, if it's wet or whatever, the crossing of the runways has to be read back. That's probably the most common one for us, but it's been elements of all common um, airways clearances recently that I've been having to chase, which is, yeah, the last couple of months, I don't know why, but it just seems to be a bit of a, a thing at the moment. Yep, cool. Thanks, mate. Okay, so what can controllers do to actually help pilots? Okay, one of the big things is weather information. If you're out west of here and the weather's poor, you can make a request. I mean, if you're outside of VHF range, call through sector. Can you... Can Tamworth advise what the weather's like there? You have a person sitting here who's an approved weather observer who can tell you exactly what the weather's doing. A lot of us have a lot of local knowledge about weather patterns here, what storms do, what fronts do, what fog does and that sort of thing. So that's one of the big things we can do. Technical advice. Now, when you call a chair, you may not be speaking to a pilot, but you may very well be. However, again, here in Tamworth, we have access to at least three Lamies who are very happy to share their expertise free of charge. So if you have a technical issue, make it known and we can get some advice for you very quickly. The other thing with the technical advice is you never know who's listening. So about six or seven years ago, there was a 210 at Moree that was having a great deal of difficulty getting his gear down. He tried everything and a dash eight came onto frequency here. The captain said, oh, the captain asked me, do you know anything about that 210 at Moree? So I called sector and they said, no, he's still trying to get the gear down. And what the captain then said was, my co-pilot's got several thousand hours on 210s. He advised a solution, which I then passed on to sector who passed on to the 210, who tried it and got the gear down. So you just don't know who's listening. There may be someone with infinitely more experience on your aircraft type that may have a solution that you haven't thought of yet. Navigation. If you're navigationally embarrassed or geographically embarrassed, again, please speak up. We have some really good surveillance tools with ADSB. And even with the radar, we may have to climb you a bit, but we should be able to get you around this area. Most areas have radar coverage within sort of four to 5,000 feet above sea level. Here in Tamworth, we have ADS-B coverage on the ground, so we get very good coverage there. The other thing is, again, you have a lot of local knowledge. So if you're within VHF range of Tamworth and you describe what you can see, there's every chance most of the controllers here will be able to pinpoint where you are and get you back on your map. So anytime you're feeling unsure, speak up. Medical's a bit of a strange one, but most towers have a direct line to their local hospital ED. We certainly do. So if there is a medical issue on board, or if you need an ambulance, or if you need assistance, call us. We can call the hospital, we can call the ED, we can get the advice you need really quickly. And as I alluded to, the local knowledge is a big thing. You've got controllers like myself. I've been here for 17 years. I grew up to the west of Kunibau, uh, to the west of here, and I did all my flying training here. So I know the area. If the, if you have a problem, 
please feel free to, to call up. I know I've said it a few times, but when in doubt, ask. As I said, I'd rather go out, go over it several times so we're all on the same page. And don't ever be afraid to speak up. If you speak up and there's a problem, we can get it fixed. OK, my very last slide. Thank you very much for attending the webinar. The little QR code will take you through to Air Services, Airspace and our safety teams. And I'll have a look at the chat. I know there's a couple of questions I've been able to answer, but I'll have a quick look at the chat. And if Tim would like to take control of the webinar, we'll continue on. Thank you very much. Lovely, thanks. Thanks so much for that, Anthony. Um, yeah, thanks, Martin, who just who just texted in. Thank you, highly informative and reassuring. No, well done, mate, thanks. Um, only a couple of slides to go, guys, and then we can we will have a little bit of time to dive into a few questions. Um, really, just to just to sum up th th these key points, I just reiterate what Anthony was saying um, with his considerable expertise. Um, what can we take away? When in doubt, ask. Please, please, please never assume or guess. And if you're unfamiliar, it's not a black mark against you, just let them know and they'll hold your hand. Um, if you can't comply, again, let them know and they'll be duty bound to give you an alternative. It might mean you might have to orbit or uh, an airways clearance may be delayed or there might be some extra track miles, but um, please let them know if you can't comply. Standard phraseology is a big one and I know that can be a bit daunting if you don't fly often, but um, that's when we, we need to get into the books and seek advice and seek help. And uh, it's actually quite amazing the, the the resources that ATC have to provide us with assistance when we're when we're in flight. And really, at the end of the day, one of the things I want to just emphasise is it really is a two way partnership. They can't do their job without us, and flying into these places, we can't do our job without without them. Um, so please jump onto our pilot safety hub just before we look at some of these questions. Jump onto our pilot safety hub for more information. And really the the motto of our safety hub is your safety is in your hands. And it's up to all pilots to take that initiative and make use of the myriad of safety education product that's actually out there in industry right now that all the aviation safety agencies are providing. You know, even if we fly privately or, you know, we may only fly um, uh, infrequently, we can all aim for excellence and try and commit ourselves to really bettering our safety knowledge, um, no matter how experienced we are. Um, so look, a big thank you for everyone that's, you know, taken the time and effort to come along and, and join us this afternoon. That Pilot Safety Hub has all resources in it. We've previously looked at things like non-controlled airfields. We've looked at flight planning. We've looked at, 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 at weather and forecasting as well. You'll find on there links to podcasts, videos, worksheets, maps, booklets, and all sorts of other great information. We do have another webinar coming up in the next few weeks. Um, this one is uh, falls under that controlled aerodrome topic, and it looks specifically at runway safety, especially the risks associated with runway incursions. And that runway incursion webinar, uh, registrations will open for that really soon. And that's going to be held on Thursday, the 15th of June, um, kicking off at one o'clock Eastern time this time. Um, we do have some time for some questions, Anthony. Have you opened up the the uh, the chat section, mate? I have, and I've just got a, I've got an answer for Warwick Darlow on the Code One at Archerfield Tower. Yeah, do you want to just work through some of those, mate, in the time yeah. we've got left? So for Warwick, I've just got a text from the boss at Archerfield. He said Code One means they're going to do a practice engine failure after a touch and go, and it's usually completed prior to reaching the upwind threshold. There you go. Beautiful. And we also had another comment earlier, um, Anthony, about um, someone visited uh, Camden and in the tower once and they had what looked like a radar screen. I think they were talking about the TSAD. Do you just want to talk yeah. about what the TSAD is and does? So this is the TSAD, if I can find the button, which I can't in a hurry. Might need someone younger and smarter to find the button for me. So it's not a radar Green. It's a picture of a radar. So like I said in my presentation, we can use it to... That's right, Bevan. I've got my best Bevan on the job. He'll do it now. Um, we can use it to 
look at aircraft and it will let us know for situation where it's where the aircraft are, but I can't actually use it for separation. So I can use it for situation awareness, so I can use it for identification. So if you say I'm 35 miles north at 6,500, I can look at this and say, okay, yes, you are. So then that starts my situation awareness. If you are geographically embarrassed and you've climbed to 6,500 and I see you on there squawking ident, then again, I can work out where you are. So it's what's called a TSAT or a tower situation awareness display. Yeah, and you can't actually use that for separation, can you? That's correct. Yeah, okay. So it's a situational awareness tool. Yes. Um, other questions that have come in, of, um, we're recording all these, so we will get to everyone, but I'll just take a, a smattering. Greg um, texted in, what does Squawk Code 3000 do in the Class D environment? That's the... Um... <laughs> And so that, that's the score code for, I think it's, is it VFR in class D? Yeah. So it's just, it, I think it's what it's 1200 in class G, 3000 in class D. Yep. yep. So it's just a, a symbol on the screen. Okay. It helps you paint on the screen. Yeah. Um, another question, when entering over a reporting point and you say I'm overhead, whatever that point is, would you prefer us to be overhead when we start that transmission? or maybe a little bit earlier so that we're overhead or about to be overhead as at the end of the transmission? Probably when you're a little bit earlier. It yep. depends very much on how close the position is to the boundary as well. If it's close to the boundary, obviously it's better to start prior to the position so that we've got time to process the transmission and then the clearance and then read back before you actually enter control airspace. Yep. What we prefer here is if you're not coming via a VFR approach point is to re report at 10 miles prior to the boundary. So if you're coming in above 3,500, that's at 25 miles for most of the airspace in Tamworth. Cool. Thank you. Um, Peter texted in, said, I'm planning to overfly a Class D tower that has Class C above it. Do I contact the tower or centre for clearance? Well, I suppose it depends on what airspace you're in. Depends very much on what height. So somewhere like Tamworth, Albury, Alice Springs, if you're 6,500 or above, you contact centre. If you're below 6,500, you contact tower. For most of the rest of them, if you're above 4,500, uh, contact centre. Below 4,500, contact tower except for Rocky Mackay and Hobart Lonnie, which are centre. Yep, okay. So yeah, it just right. depends very much on the altitude and that that's where giving the, the particular tower a call can make a big difference. Yeah, lovely. Um, Matt texted in, if I need to enter class C, so entering class C from outside of controlled airspace, do I contact centre first to get a code and do they provide the clearance in? Because Matt is actually more used to operating in the Class D environment and contacting the tower directly. Similar to the overfly, depends on the height and depends okay. on the tower. So coming to Tamworth, if you're entering Class C at 6,500, you contact tower directly. Above yep. 6,500, contact centre. Mm -hmm. Even then they may hand it straight off to the tower if they've got nothing in the way. They may end up saying they'll talk to us and we'll organise a clearance through. Okay. Um, Baden texted in, if you struggle with the ground phase or, you know, with the taxi phase of your flight on the ground, I've been informed that if you request detailed taxi, you'll yep. actually get guided point to point while taxiing. Is that true? Perfect um, phraseology. And again, when you come off the runway, you just say uh, Tamworth Ground, Alpha Bravo, Charlie, Four, Sigma, unfamiliar, request detailed taxi. And I will give you exactly bit by bit. So I'll say, taxi, take taxiway left, cross runways. I'll watch you until you get towards the next taxiway that you've got to go. Then I'll say, take taxiway right. And I'll give you specific instructions to get where you need to go. So that perfect thing to say. Yep. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the flavour of many of these questions coming in is basically who do I talk to on first contact? Yeah. And I suppose that's when a really good detailed look at the airspace chart and your and your altitude should give you that information. That's um, right. A quick question here from Iman talking about flight following. Um, 
Uh, that's a service that air services um, provide if you are within radar or ADSB coverage yep. um, and you um, are suitably equipped, you're in class G and they'll um, they will provide you with navigation assistance, traffic information. They'll also hold a SAR for you. Um, so if you are in and around uh, airspace that you are unfamiliar with or the weather's getting a bit iffy and you're being pushed up against terrain and things like that, that could be something to uh, consider. But ultimately, if safety of flight is of issue, get that clearance and they'll do what they can to assist. What else have I got just before we leave? Um, uh, here's one for Archerfield. Yeah, How I, come I can't Archer... answer that. <laughs> no, I can't answer so, that. Can't yeah, answer but that's that. right. We will get to that, Kevin. Don't worry, we're recording all this. We will get back. Um, what else have we got? Um, I'll, I'll take a screenshot of that and, and pass it on. And Yeah, um, we'll get back to all you guys. Um, more on flight following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. Ben, what's the best way to prompt or ask ATC if you have been told to extend a leg of the circuit, such as downwind, and you've gone well and truly past your um, your anticipated turn point. In other words, and I'm just reading between the lines here, Ben, what do you do if ATC seem to have forgotten about you? Speak up. Speak up. Yep. So the best way is something like um, Alpha Bravo Charlie is ready, and basically say something like Alpha Bravo Charlie ready for base. Um, that will then prompt the controller to go, okay, why are they still on downwind? Okay, it may be yep. the controller hasn't forgotten they still need you to extend downwind because of X, Y, or Z. Yeah, cool. Or, or yeah, it, okay, things work, turn base. So, yeah, use the word ready. So, yeah, Ben, the best way is Alpha Bravo Charlie, ready for base or ready yeah, for cool. crosswind or whatever it is. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. And here's a quick one. At night, um, uh, do you, pr if uh, if um, you're requesting a position from an aircraft, do you prefer a radial? With procedural towers, I always prefer a radial. So if you're giving me Excellent. a position, I want distance and radial and altitude. And then that, that updates my mental map as to where you are, who, what you want to do and how far you're out and how far, how long I've got to react. Cool. I hope that answers that one, Paul. Gareth, you've got a big one there, but we'll record that and get back. And yeah, look, that's about it. Um, what have we done? 50 minutes. That's not too bad, is it? I know people have a relatively limited attention span with webinars and all the rest of it, and it is late in the day or getting towards late afternoon. Look, I'd just like to take this opportunity to, uh, on behalf of everyone that's tuned in around the country, to thank Anthony for his time sitting up there in his, his little perch <laughs> in Tamworth. Um, really good information from the subject matter expert. Um, I hope we've dispelled a few myths and maybe even reduced some of the anxiety that a lot of pilots feel whenever they have to interact with, with ATC. Um, please, can I just encourage you to dive onto our Pilot Safety Hub again, have a look at the resources there, and the registrations will be open really soon for our um, next webinar, Thursday the 15th of June, starting at one o'clock, looking at runway safety and looking especially at the scourge of those runway incursions. And um, we're going to be interviewing a, a senior airline pilot and a member of our National Runway Safety Group here in Australia. So um, we'll let everyone go. Thanks very much for joining us. And we certainly look forward to uh, catching up with you next time. All the very best. Bye. Thank you all.